People ask me, how do you get films? How do you get to do them? And normally, I think as probably most of you, if you're composers, do is you send out tapes or maybe you've got an agent who, who goes and finds things. But this was one of those sort of dream, dream fantasy ones where you know you think of Steven Spielberg bringing you up. Well, in this case, I was in a room and Bruce Beresford saw me across the room and just charged across and said, Do you want to do my movie? Which blew me away. <laughs> it was that fabulous. Um, it was because it's a ballet film. It required a lot of different um, roles from me. I also took on the role of music supervisor with the film as well. So I had sort of complete control over everything to do with the music. Um, there was um, someone who, Kim Green, who is often a music, um, music supervisor, but she, she licensed um, a couple of found tracks. But everything else um, I did. Um, which meant that my first job was to normally, as a composer, you come on pretty much at the end of the film. If the film's near, nearing a fine cut, you know what you're dealing with. But in the case of Mao's Last Dancer, they actually needed me to compose music so that they could choreograph to it and then 
build, build that. Uh, and then um, I was on during the actual shoot for part of it uh, because there are musicians on the screen and I had to be there to make sure that it all sort of looked authentic, if you like. And then I did the score. And all of that was on and off for about a year. Um, the very end of December uh, 2007 and then through to um, about September 2008. The first cue um, that, that we'll see in this, in this sequence is a bit where Lee has been at the ballet school and as you'll see, he's, he's not doing too well and hasn't quite found the motivation and he's feeling very homesick. So the first piece that we see is like a memory of going back home. Um, I had done a structure with the film. Um, it was great hearing the, the, the script adaptation thing this morning and you know, think, thinking, thinking through on, on structure and all that. And of course, composer has to do that too. Um, and if you take away the fact that Malthus Dancer has flashbacks and just sort of takes the story as it actually happened chronologically, there's a Chinese sequence and then there's an American sequence in simple terms. First half, second half, if you like. And what I did was for the, for the beginning, I only used ethnic Chinese instruments. I used five Chinese instruments and only used those. And when it gets to the ballet school, I added strings for that Western string orchestra um, to a peak. When we go to America, I brought a whole score back to just the piano. And then as it progresses, I introduced orchestral strings to that piano. And it's only at the very, very end that I pulled out all stops and let the whole orchestra go. So I mean, literally like the last 30, 40 seconds, which we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, where I let it rip. Now, of course, in between there, there's the Rite of Spring and there's Don Quixote and all these stage works, but I'm just talking about the actual score itself um, to, give it, to give it some shape. So what we're going to see now is he's at the ballet school and um, I think there are strings in this cue, but you'll hear that it's predominantly using the various ethnic, um, ethnic instruments. Now let's see if I get this right. Picture? Yes. Another picture. Let's see if this works. <laughs> that took a little yeah, that took a little longer than I expected, so I don't have a lot of time, but uh, I have some questions about something if you have any. Um, yeah, I'll just ask you a quick question, a technical question. Um, uh, just to do with you're talking about the, the, the pre-recorded elements. So obviously you wrote some pieces that had to be pre-recorded to be choreographed and shot before you, you went to the scoring process. Um, what about the pieces that you mentioned, Giselle, and, uh, and there's also the newsreel one, which I, I wondered about whether or not match, you, you'd match that later. You just I matched it later, yes. Did you have to match it to the timing of the original music that was there? There was no music there. Oh, okay. So just right. like scoring a scene. So you just created yeah. the music yeah. to match. But your, 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 your other ones are, um, um, are interesting. Um, with, um, with Giselle and with Don Quixote and with something other else. Oh, we did Ramonda, Ramonda, which ended up not in the film. Um, the ballet dancer is the person who um, uh, establishes the tempo of music. And it's up to the conductor to remember that rehearsals and achieve the same tempo for the dancer. So with those ones where they're going to, like we saw with Giselle and Don Quixote, um, that meant that we went into a very small studio and the, the dancer Lee, um, sorry, um, Chi, Chai, um, um, went through the movements, or Swan Lake as well, there's two Swan Lake bits. Um, went through all the movements with, with a rehearsal pianist and we recorded that piano. Um, and that was our starting guide. We then put a click to that piano because it was rough, it was all sort of really, it was really quite messy, lots of mistakes and everything because it was just getting a tempo. We put a click to that tempo 
And I went into the studio and got another pianist to actually play the music properly to that click. Mm. Now in the process, we cleaned the click up a little bit. You know, once, once, because most of it, you don't have to have every single note, you know, the click every, um, for the dance, you have to have the, just the general tempo, the general flow, so you get your, your key points and smooth out the bits. So we recorded a new piano, and that piano was the recording that they filmed to um, in China and in Australia. Australia stood in for America. In, in this thing. Um, then the movie was cut to that, that guide piano. And once the movie was cut, we, we, put the, we put the click up again and reworked and smoothed the click out even more. And then threw the piano out and recorded the orchestra over my time. Yeah, so it was a whole sort of whole thinking ahead. Um, and when they went to shoot, it was, oh, it was a nightmare because there were pieces that, you know, there were guys, there were stand-ins, there were, um, um, this is the real piece, but MIDI, this is the actual real piece and all of that. And it all had to be color-coded. It was this whole big thing, so that everybody knew exactly what was going on. So that was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. yeah. And the strange thing about um, Don Quixote is, although it's a you know a major ballet that's played all the time, it seems the only orchestration of it that was written in the, in the 19th century. The only orchestration of it is by John Lanchbury, and he's dead now. But it's the work is still in copyright, like that orchestration. So you have to hire the parts to get it. So I thought that was a bit of a pain, so I just grabbed the piano piece and orchestrated it myself, yeah. which was real fun. The very last thing I did was uh, spend two days orchestrating Don Quixote, which is great because you had to get into a 19th century frame of mind, mm -hmm. which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of orchestration as opposed to composition, can you speak to anything how sometimes that role gets divided up, for example? Like, I um, mean, people play a really great live piano back in the day. If I wanted to write something more ambitious for strings, would that suffice? If they, you know, here's my basic. Suffice to, yeah. to give to someone else to orchestrate? Yes, it would. Yeah. 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 yeah, it would. I don't use an orchestrator. I always. I understand. Yeah, I've never, never used one. But I have in the past orchestrated for other people. And I was having a conversation last night where um, I don't quite understand that, that, um, that sort of thinking. But, um, You'll find that with a good orchestrator, they can take um, pretty much anything in a bit of discussion, get it into what you want. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Who are your favourite Hollywood composers? Hollywood composers? Yeah, I think favourite Oh, well, you have to say John Williams. Mm -hmm. Not absolutely everything, but he's just extraordinary. There's nobody else like him remotely like him. It's just, he has to be the greatest composer ever. Um, other than that, I like a lot of people, I like a lot of stuff within the film, not so much to listen to outside the film. So I have a lot of respect for Carter Burwell, for example, um, who, uh, you know, he does the um, Coen Brothers films. Um, it's that thing of, his musical ideas are often very simple, but they're always just in the right tone for, the, for whatever is being said in the movie, which is something I admire a lot. There are lots of ones. <laughs> yeah. Do you orchestrate uh, the other parts on keyboard strips? Um, I'm basically pencil and paper. Right. Yeah. Although these days I compose into notation software in the finale, uh, which is the same process, but it just means that once it's there, it's easy to copy parts and you can use the copy and paste function to, if it's doing the same thing as the oboe, it's really good to just copy it down and, and all of that. So I've got quite good at composing on, on 30 inch monitor. Because <laughs> you can get, get an A3 back yeah. Do you do need mock-ups? I do, I well, do have to because the director has to be able to hear what it is you're doing and whoever else, executives or whatever. Um, I always find that the hardest part. Um, I find some things in finale you can mock up very um, successfully straight away. Mao's last answer is whatever came off finale with the sounds that come with it, that's what I played to Bruce and it worked, it was fine. Uh, whereas other films, um, the sounds just aren't working because of the nature of the music. And so then, um, that's the part I hate. So I, if I can, I get something else to do the mock-ups for them. Yeah. Chris, there's probably only time for one more question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to ask how um, closely Bruce directed the process, or did you pretty much have free reign because he loved your work and trusted you? 
It was sort of both, um, in that uh, Bruce is, a, is well known for being an opera director and a great lover of music as well. Um, so it was just like we were on the same page straight away, mm -hmm. and not a lot of words were needed. Um, so it really came down. And the other thing too was, you know, often on a film, everybody's very nervous about how the composer's going to stuff up your film. You know, you've just spent two years making it. You know, you've got it great, and you need someone to come in, and instead they go and do rubbish all over it. Um, so they're very nervous, but in the case of my last answer, because I had to write music beforehand, and I actually had a recording session, they got to hear some key music, and I, just the change, the trust, I've never experienced it before or since, where everybody was just, they just knew the composer had it right, you know, for, so that, that, that helped a lot. Um, so, the next time Bruce really came on, and remember I'd already been on set and hanging around all the, you know, on and off through, through the year, by well, the time I got to do the score, um, it was, uh, I just sort of showed it to him one day, really, and it, pretty much everything was fine. I think he made one or two small changes, and he checked those, you know. Um, so it was one of those, uh, we're just on the same page, straight yeah. away, and that makes it so easy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, before we finish, I just wanted, I, I was going to show you, but I didn't know how much time I would take, um, some clips of the recording sessions, so you can see the, the um, musicians playing. Um, they're amateur clips. I just bought a video camera the day before and my wife was trying it out, but we edited it together. So if you go to YouTube and go to the channel Christopher Gordon MFN, it stands for Magic Fire Music, which is my company. Thank Christopher Gordon MFN. Um, go there, you'll see uh, three three of those, plus there's other things as well from other films. So that's a video channel. Well, thank you so much. For coming over from Australia and joining the Big Screen Symposium. And also, thank you so much, ACRA, for sponsoring. It's been fantastic. Mm -hmm. thank, you. Yeah, thank you.